let's welcome Casper Colleen Nielsen uh, from Denmark um, and Jean Zhao Zhaoyi and Xiu Xinyu started the show to the bookworm. And thank you, David, wherever you are, to putting <laughs> <laughs> this together. And a shout out to uh, Beijing Sci Fi Book Club. You know where you are. <laughs> All right. So we're here to talk about um, Casper's book, the first, very first book that he wrote 10 years ago, which is called Mount Copenhagen. Um, when we were kids, we were always asked, what does 21st century look like? We always draw plenty of trees with jetpack riders. Um, and um, now we have sci-fi novels. They're all, they all seem too pessimistic in a way that shows technology and overindulgence and a dystopic future for us. Um, which is all dark and gloomy, which is how the grown-ups like it, right? Um, but no, Mount Copenhagen feels different. Explo it explores how nature and culture <laughs> continuously reformulate one another. Or we're talking about water world or Jurassic Park, etc. We're not just talking about concrete buildings. We're creating new terrains and changing climates with a self-sufficient ecological system. In fact, let's pull out some digits to have a scale in our head. Mount Copenhagen is 3.5 kilometers high with a circumference of 55 kilometers. And it takes 200 years to build. And the cost in the area is approximately 120 billion US dollars. Um, so Casper, would you care to elaborate your vision of Mount Copenhagen and how did you come up with the, all, all of it? Well, it, it all started 20 years ago. I was walking home from, uh, I've been out drinking, and I was walking home uh, in the morning, and I was crossing this bridge in Copenhagen, and I looked down the canal for some reason, and, uh, and then that morning the clouds had gathered together in, this, in the shape of a mountain, a huge mountain, like just south of Copenhagen. And uh, I was looking at this beautiful mountain, and. Uh, and ever since I've just, you know, when I was falling asleep at night, I've just been wondering about this mountain, you know, imagining that there was a mountain south of Copenhagen. You, you should all know that Denmark is a completely flat country. We don't have any mountains at all, you know, and actually we, we barely have nature in Denmark. It's all industrial, uh, agricultural areas. And uh, so maybe, maybe we're longing a little bit for nature. And then, you know, just to get my facts straight, uh, at some point I decided to uh, call up a lot of professors at the university to find out what the implications would be of a mountain, how would that affect the weather, you know, what kind of animals would be able to live there in different places on the animal, uh, on the mountain. And, and uh, you know, uh, the temperature falls one degree for every hundred meters, you, you rise above sea level, so there would be a glacier on top and uh, in the springtime there would be melting water and a mm -hmm. river delta would emerge around the, the mountain. And, um, and then I thought, you know, I thought it was a great project. I thought it was great you spending 100, 130 billion US dollars on something that's just nice to have, you know. Yeah. <laughs> on something that you don't really need, you know because everything seems so functionalistic right now. And, um, and then I thought about, you know, also that uh, it's strange that we're living in the rich richest period in, in the history of mankind. And uh, with, for some reason, we, s we don't build monuments anymore. We used to yeah. build monuments. Yeah. China did, Europe did. We are traveling around the world to see this, you know, fantastic wonders. Um, but for some reason, we don't do that anymore. And uh, I think that's a shame. Yeah. If we look back in history, our ancestor built so many architectural monuments. Think of um, Babel Towers of Babylon, Great Pyramids of Egypt, uh, the Great Wall of China, of course. Um, the Great Pyramids of Egypt took uh, 100,000 labor force for 20 years. So it's two decades. And the Great Wall took 
one-fifth of the entire population back then, so roughly a million to do the whole construction and it's been for nine years. And um, Mount Copenhagen is a 200 years. It's a long-term project and it's just something, you, there's, there's nothing in comparison to. <laughs> um, so I, that's why I was gonna ask you, um, for a massive structure like this, there are, are there any various challenges um, regarding the physical geography and civic uh, ecosystem, etc.? Yeah, I guess there is. I'm, I'm not. Uh, I, I don't know exactly. You know how it would uh, how it would affect you know Denmark geologically. You know, at, at some point I was calling a, a professor in geology, and at that point I, my plan was to build a, a mountain that was completely massive. And he said, "Yeah, you can do that, but it uh, it would you, you had to uh, you had to uh, it could create earthquakes in right. Denmark." But uh, he thought that was a, a minor problem, you know. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, of course, he was right, you know. But but now the project ended up being, you know, it, first of all, let me explain. It's it's a it's a collection of short stories, and uh, it's about it's 17 stories about people who live around and on the mountain mm -hmm. and they are sometimes interconnected these stories but mainly it's it, it's just a short story and the main character is the this huge artificial mountain um but so unlike other sci-fi stories unlike your other sci-fi stories which has a main character and a whole and a main plot mm. yeah. the mount copenhagen itself is the theme mm. But, but how are these characters related to the mountain? It just, they're just related in the, because they live on the mountain mm -hmm. or very close to the mountain. Mm -hmm. And it sort of also wanted to explore a little bit how that would perhaps change Danish mentality because Denmark, you know, people in Northern Europe mm -hmm. are very much, uh, we're very much uh, sort of quiet and shy and uh, we are really. and. Uh, and we're not very open to new people. It's uh, we're not uh, sort of flamboyant, and uh, we're sort of humble. In a way, <laughs> sounds terrible, but I think it's a, in a way it's true. So I was also trying to explore how that might change, you know, the attitude because the whole project was so huge and fantastic, you know. Um, yeah. Um, Xinyu has a question for you. Yeah. While you were um, imagining this mountain in your head, um, did you do any research, like finding like a real, is there any inspiration for this mountain uh, instead of the imaginative one? Did you do any field works, go hiking? <laughs> well, not really. <laughs> but but, but uh, I was inspired by... Uh, I was inspired by a concrete project that was the uh, the dome in uh, in uh, in Florence. Do you know that the, the yeah. Domo? Mm -hmm. It's the a beautiful dome. church in Florence, mm -hmm. and it took 100, 100, 150 years to build. Mm -hmm. And uh, but it started the Renaissance. Yeah. So uh, so it was an amazing project and. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, it, it's it's really hard for me to understand why we're not building stuff like that anymore because it seems like such a great investment, also. Yeah. You know, in but the long term. True, but back then we have um, we have a purpose or a cause to build something like that. With um, let's say there's got to be a, pro a religious faith kind of thing to congregate all that massive workforce together, and also let's not forget. Um, only under some social, some <laughs> uh, uh, system. Uh, yes, um, there's got to be a political system that could do that, and that's basically just uh, mm, that that centralization. Yeah, centralized. Centralized uh, government could actually pull it through. So, in a modern day setting, it's. It just seems like very. <laughs> yeah, but hard. I also think you know that uh, it's also the way we look at nature. I think it's uh, 
nature is something we today destroy, mm. basically, and uh, and then sometimes we preserve it. But you know, if 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 you if you compare this project in, you can compare this project in in money and size with the Central Park in New York, for instance. Mm -hmm. That's something. Why why don't you just like cut it down mm. and uh, and make apartments there? You could make a fortune. The reason why they're not doing it is because they somehow think it's important to have a park there. But so sometimes we we do uh, um, spend a lot of money actually on on keeping mm. green areas. Mm -hmm. um, but I also think that we think about pollution. Uh, we, we think about nature as something that we cannot destroy too much, and there's something we have to preserve. Uh, but we don't think of nature as something you can actually create, and right. I think it's very, uh, it's very uh, easy to create nature in in a certain sense. It's because if you uh, if you build a small hill somewhere, you know, animals will start living there, and people, things will grow immediately by themselves. And uh, and I'm very interested in these sort of hybrids between something natural and something cultural. I think that's very uh, interesting. Uh, for instance, my my father he lives in the north of Sealand, mm -hmm. and uh, and very close to his house there's a, an area which is very expensive, and mm -hmm. the reason why it's expensive is because there's three small hills there, like mm -hmm. at the ocean sides, mm -hmm. and uh, everybody thinks it's, it's a wonderful place. Mm -hmm. So so now it's uh, it's preserved. There's some goats running around there, mm -hmm. and. Uh, and but really, it's just 500 meters of hills. You know, it's yeah. just really easy to create. And I always thought, why why don't we create stuff like that? It's very easy. Yeah. It grows on its own, and it have its own bioform of its own organic system. And yeah, so yeah. I like to think of it as a almost a living thing, although yeah. it's artificial. Yeah. Oh, would you like to? Because earlier we were talking about um, the actual. Um, structure of the mountain. Yeah, because like because after after I wrote the book, I really didn't know that much about it. Actually, I just thought it was a great idea, you know, because as I said, it was nice to have. But um, but then I uh, we we sort of developed the project, and uh, the the plan then became to build a a 3.5 kilometers high mountain, but in a in a hollow construction made of concrete, and then put earth on it, dirt on it, uh, 50 meters of dirt and then grow a forest on it. And then inside the plan is, was to have a hydroelectric plant. And um, so you would have a, you would have a glacier on top mm -hmm. and then underneath, but inside the mountain at the top you would have a reservoir of melting water and that would run down a hydroelectric pr plant creating electricity. Mm -hmm. And then, um, because we have a surplus of energy from our windmills in Denmark when at night and when it's windy, so uh, and right now we're selling the surplus energy on the on the s into Germany uh, and Sweden and Norway very cheaply. But if you had a mountain like that, you you could send in the electricity in the mountain and send the water back up in the reservoir, and you could you could store energy in the mountain so it would become a battery and uh, mm -hmm. this is something we uh, discussed with uh, the largest uh, energy corporation in Denmark called uh, Dong, now called Ørsted and uh, they thought it was a great idea you know <laughs> but uh, you know I really just wrote the book it was really just a fantasy but then afterwards we started working on the project and a lot of huge companies were interested in in the project, <laughs> it's completely ridiculous, and uh, so. Uh, but but it was really funny because it was really interesting talking to uh, like huge companies like Mask and, and places like that about yeah. this this book. This uh, uh, so um, yeah. Um, <coughs> a thought experiment that you did um, when you before you go to bed mm. turns out to be this massive project that it's allegedly coming to life. Um, I, I'm actually curious about what, uh, what, do, you, what do you guys think well, from your point of view? Mm. <laughs> oh, the, oh. 
For the downside of this mountain, you yeah. got, you have you block the sun sunshine. Yeah, yeah. Off. Certain area would the residents agree with it? No, and no. the winds, do we discuss? Would you like to elaborate on it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I placed it uh, the mountain south of Copenhagen, mm. and that was a kind of a mistake <laughs> because uh, because it means there would be a huge mm. shadow yeah. being cast yes. on on the whole of Copenhagen almost. Mm -hmm. So uh, <laughs> so you know that's uh, that's a that's a mistake. You know, mm. and I have to take responsibility for that mistake. <laughs> you know, I take full responsibility. <laughs> but uh, yeah. So uh, and and of course there's a lot of downsizes, you know, mm. on a mountain like this. But mm. but it was really just a fantasy that I wanted to explore. Mm. Mm. And um, yeah, and sort of an a, th a thought experiment mm. that I thought was wonderful mm. in my mind, anyway. So this mountain is basically a natural setting, or does it have like a kind of like civilized um. yeah the, the, the it's uh, the area has been uh, people are living on the mountain and uh -huh. building houses on the mountain and uh -huh. that's how they financed it, financed it in the building project uh, process and um, and uh, you know so it's uh, it's a it's a place where people live but it's also mm -hmm. a huge place where you can just mm -hmm. uh, go for a walk or mm -hmm. Go for a ride on your bicycle or go with your girlfriend or whatever, you know, have a great time. Mm. It's just a, a, a huge place mm. of leisure. It's like mm. a huge investment in, in leisure mm. and free activity mm. and a great view and, and mm. stuff like that. Mm. So, um, so that was the whole idea, you know, mm. using all your energy, all the money in the world <laughs> to create something that's really just fun and nice to have. And I think that's also how I view uh, mm -hmm. arts in a way, you know, that you have to you have to really mm -hmm. work really hard for many hours every mm -hmm. day to create something that mm -hmm. that seems like something you can just you, you could really uh, that, you, that your life is not dependent on or other people's lives are not dependent mm -hmm. on. But like people people's preference change over time, mm. like fashion or something. Mm. Will someday people get tired of this mountain and say, we don't want mountain, we want <laughs> flatland. What, what will happen then? Well, you know, <laughs> I don't know. It sounds like crazy people. <laughs> you know. Crazy people build this mountain, <laughs> right? <laughs> it's hard for me to, uh, to imagine that, you know. But, you know, but, but, uh, but you're right, but... They just but have to use their tax money and, and tear it apart <laughs> no, all but, over again. But I think it's also an experiment what we're doing right now, you know, mm -hmm. how we create our cities right now. Everybody is so... everything is so functional. That's mm -hmm. also a huge experiment, isn't it? That uh, the sort of aesthetic of new buildings, of uh, how you create cities, has been taken out. It's really a huge experiment, isn't it? Mm -hmm. In the, with people uh, that we now have to live in in major huge cities with yeah. no uh, mm -hmm. uh, nature. Yeah. It's it's uh, we haven't lived like that ever, you know, mm -hmm. in human history. Mm -hmm. But uh, but recently that's how we live. We're living, and mm -hmm. uh, it's really an experiment, isn't it? Um, so uh, yeah. Uh, Xinyu has a question for the residents up on the mountains. Um, we're, we were talking about how um, ecological and social, uh, all the impact um, on the uh, on physical and ecological. Um, but what about um, people who live there? Um, what's their legal? Uh, um, what's their men social social status? Or um, no, no, their mentality. What about any changes in their yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, people mindset. who live in the mountain for generations become mm. sort of a little bit weird. You know, sort of uh, um, a person. Mm. People who don't like to talk to other people and stuff like that. Yeah, they're getting. And then the it, then <laughs> it's it's mainly rich people who uh, can mm. afford to live on the mountain mm. because it, it becomes a very attractive place to live. 
But there's uh, there's also a huge area, and there's uh, Eskimos from Greenland <laughs> who are moving up on the mountain and just uh, <laughs> settling down there in in Klondikes illegally. <laughs> And the police is having a really hard time locating them and, uh, and you know, throwing them in jail. Mm -hmm. And every time they, you know, tear down a Klondike, they're back the next week. You know, <laughs> it's, uh, it's really difficult. So, uh, <laughs> Sounds like, like they're having uh, their own community or even a new cult. Or, um. Yeah, they're hiding. <laughs> so what other people live in this mountain? Yeah. Apart from Eskimo and rich people, Eskimos and rich people, but it, <laughs> <laughs> that's really about it. You know. What's the so stories about? Well, the stories about um, it's as I said, 17 short stories, and um, I was very. I had a lot of rules for myself when I wrote the book, and one of the rules I had was that I didn't want any of the characters in the story to have uh, past. Um, because I thought that many, a lot of literature today and a lot of movies actually mm. is uh, is sort of uh, using a psychoanalytic scheme of mm -hmm. how to describe uh, human development and uh, and uh, I don't like psychoanalysis. I think it's a sort of a philosophy that's dying out. Um, so I, I wanted everything to be very concrete and. Um, and about people having plans for something that they just they're just doing and they're not mm -hmm. thinking so much, too much about it, so people are not even reflecting really in the book. And then I wanted all the short stories to be uh, more or less like sculptures, you know, like the mountain is a is a is a sculpture. So, for instance, there's a story about this guy who uh, who's very fascinated by birds. He's a he's a doctor, and. Uh, and he's coming home from work one night and then he watches a video of ducks and while he watches this video it hits him that the reason why birds can fly is because they have no legs or they have legs of course but they're very thin they're mainly just upper bodies birds and uh, and then he starts this uh, working program he, he loses a lot of weight and it's a really intense program he loses a lot of kilos and then he's he's going to the hospital and he got his uh, hips and legs cut off and he redu he reduces his uh, his weight by 60 percent and then he uh, he builds some wings he can put on his back and then uh, he's where he weighs at the end he weighs 17 kilo kilos and he walks from the hospital out in a cab and takes the cab out to, up to the mountain and throws himself out and uh, and he can fly as a bird so that's that's sort of one of the stories in the book. Brilliant. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, any of you in here? Uh, I'm so I'm I meant all the Danish people in here. Um, raise your hand if you read Mount Copenhagen. Great. Then listening to um, Casper talking now. about it. <laughs> Um, we felt like that it has a certain um, similarity with uh, Italo Calvino, in a sense, that um, uh, they, they just pull out something out of thin air and give you Im info dumps, and um, it just and makes the, and cohesively makes the, the storyline go uh, pretty smooth within the characters. Um, I, so really, I really love Italo Calvino. I think so. He was a wonderful writer, and uh, I, I'm really inspired by Italo Calvino. Actually, he wrote a book called The Cosmocomical. I don't know if you know that book. You know that book? It's a great book, and it's just it's it, it's one of the first time I read literature that was really fun and light at the same time as you know it was also really philosophical and mm -hmm. interesting and. And uh, I'm really much inspired by his sort of type of writing. I, I would like to write like him, like he, as good as he did. So, but but yeah, I'm very much inspired by him. But also, uh, I'm very inspired by Franz Kafka, who I think was, oh. was also oh, writing yeah. very, uh, especially his short stories. I really love because they're also very concrete and uh, and it's strange, you know. Sometimes if you 
if you read a, a Kafka short story, it's uh, you can analyze it in different ways, but it doesn't take anything from the story. It seems like it's immu immune to any analysis. I want to draw us back to uh, reality um, and talk about something that uh, feels closer to home. Um, we all know that uh, Northern Europe is pretty famous for their um, social welfare system. And um, we're facing a global uh, crisis of, aging, of an aging society. Um, I was wondering um, if we have any, um, if, if you have thought about all these, um, all these matters and taken them into consideration in, in your writings. Yeah, I wrote about the. Uh, I wrote a little. I wrote about that in my second book called the Danish Civil War, which is about civil wars breaking out in Europe in the future. Um, it's a story that's that's been told by a man who's 475 years old. He's living 450 years out in the future, and he's uh, he's in this stem cell program, so he can live for, forever. And he has a dog that's 350 years old, a, a border collie that can talk, <laughs> and who's having a his the dog is having anxiety and uh, is having a hard time, you know, um, uh, agreeing with his own sexuality. Mm. And uh, and he's the main character is telling stories about the civil war in the not so distant future in, in Europe about the civil wars that, that broke out at that time. And, and one of the reasons why the civil war, uh, uh, war broke out in Europe was that uh, there was a lot of old people who sold their houses at the same time. It's the baby boomer generation. In, in Denmark they own two thirds of all houses in, in Denmark and you know at some point they are going to the market. They're come, they're, they're, when they die they houses comes on the market and uh, and that causes to crash the financial sector in, in Europe and and then you know people still have mortgages and they, they get very upset at the banks and start to break windows in the banks and uh, somebody is attacking some CEO of a big bank in Denmark and in France they burn down a bank in uh, central France and uh, and then uh, some of the rich people are getting scared and they start to hire you know, guards and the police are surrounding the banks and the big corporations and, and then all of a sudden there's, a, there's sort of a semi civil war breaking out and, uh, and on one side is people who are very angry mm -hmm. and on the other side is people who are very scared who has a lot of money and uh, who try to protect themselves. And then, um, yeah, that's my second book. And, uh, Which is called uh, Danish Civil War. Yeah. Are, um, is it any, does it is have it any sci-fi elements <laughs> <laughs> in it? Well, not apart from the fact that it's, you know, it's that you also follow this guy who's living in the future, in the distant future. He's, he's living in this community with some other super rich people mm -hmm. and, uh, and they all have these pets who are highly intelligent and human-like. As always. Yeah. But you know, it's, it's going to be interesting to see, to see how things will uh, progress in Europe because uh, you talked about dystopias before and there's a lot of people writing dystopia stories mm -hmm. dystopic story right stories yeah. right now and you see a lot of TV series about uh, the world as we know it coming to an end yeah and uh, mm -hmm. and it's interesting to think about wh why that is you know and I think one of the reasons is that uh, is the climate crisis and that we are actually destroying the planet mm -hmm. or we're destroying our place in, on the planet. But it's also, I think, that there's so much new technology that is really sort of uh, defining or changing our society. 
It's, yeah. it's not so much. There was there's this German philosopher called Peter Sloterdijk, and he's said recently that in the 20th century, we the people were the progressive parts in society. We were changing society mm. uh, through political struggles. Uh, but now in the 21st century, we the people are overweight and stupid. And the progressive forces in society today is capital management and new technology. And I think that's true in a way. You know, there's so much new technology introduced into society all the time, and we don't know the implications of this. And nobody knows the implications of the new technology that's constantly coming, and we have no control over what kind of new te technology is uh, is being developed it's just if it's possible to make it we will make it and it will happen and um, so it seems to me that we have lost um, we have lost power a little bit over how we create society we we have lost control uh, about how we it's not us controlling society anymore controlling the changes in society it's not it's not according to any plan or political idea. Mm -hmm. Things just seem to evolve by themselves. And we just, uh, we have to adapt to the changes and, and, and we have to try and understand what's going on, but it's not, we're not at the driving seat. Great. We can discuss that if somebody has questions. It's, it's an interesting topic, but uh, I think yeah. that's the situation right now. Yes. We can if we can really control or harness the um, the speed of technology progressing, then we definitely have to find some something new. Like what you've been said, um, we were talking about um, all the changes in climate and, and um, in a way that we see it. We see everything: um, the global warming. We see the, the sea rising. Actually, Kim Stanley Robinson has this uh, novel, New York, twenty one forty. If anyone read it, um, it's talking about, um, uh, of course, in the year twenty one forty, New York City has been uh, submerged, half submerged under seawater for about fifty feet. Um, so there's a 50 foot uh, sea level rise. Um, similar theme has been explored in uh, uh, let's, uh, Folding Beijing, which is also something that we wanted to talk about um, when we were discussing earlier, um, how urbanization has changed um, the culture as we live it. and. Um, what's your take in the um, nowadays in Denmark and also in Beijing? What's the near future for us? For Beijing? Mm, addressing that question to Jai uh, and Xiu Yu. Uh, for cities in general? Um, well, I think that uh, I think that everything in I think it, everything is going to be about sustainability in, mm. in a short while, and uh, and uh, you know, 90% of all the products we're using in in the West is being shipped yeah. from somewhere, usually mm. from Asia, and uh, and I think that's going to be very difficult in the future because these ships mm. that's uh, mm. transporting these goods mm. are uh, polluting crazily. Mm. Uh, I was in. Uh, I was out in Mask, the huge shipping company in, in Denmark, mm -hmm. and to give a talk. I've been there a couple of times, and uh, and um, I think it's quite possible they're going to close at some point because they're really dependent on oil, and um, mm -hmm. and I think it's going to be really difficult to ship stuff, and they don't have the technology to do it uh, in a green way. So I think that's a huge challenge. And it's going to be a huge challenge for for China and. In India and whoever you know produces a lot of goods for the West, right. um, because I think production is going to move back to Europe in a big way, because everything has to be local and has to be green, and and these computer uh, container ships they uh, they they carry eighteen thousand containers mm -hmm. a ship and uh, and they pollute, pollute crazily like they pollute 
what just one ship going to China pollutes as much as all the cars in Denmark for a year. And uh, I, I think you know the way we 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 uh, I think it, these changes are gonna come from us as customers, you know, not so much for the from the political system, but but I think more and more people will want to uh, buy stuff that's not has a huge too right. big negative. Um, yes. So it's the social awareness that. Uh, we need to work on education system. Well, I think it's just going to affect the world a lot. That everything is going to about be about sustainability, mm -hmm. and I think that's going to be a, a total uh, change in paradigm. It's it's going to be a whole new way of the industrialized world wor world to work. And actually, in a way, it's going to end uh, globalization because it, it means that we cannot move all these goods all around the world all the time. So we'll have gro globalization on the internet and, and w on one hand, and but local production much more on the other hand. Yeah. I, I think that's going to be something that will really affect the way we live and the way we uh, mm. we buy products and uh, and uh, our economies and all the countries in the globalized world. With um, sustainability crawling back to our political agenda, um, I have some questions, or rather, I, I wanted to be a more o more of an open discussion for everyone in here, as to w hearing about us talking about Mount Copenhagen. Do you what do you think of a project like that? Um, wh what what is your first impression when you f when you first heard about this, and do you have any questions for the for the author? Uh, I just wanted to say one thing. At the beginning, you quoted like this German author. I cannot uh, pronounce the name again. I'm sorry about the um, like the workers' class getting stupid and uh, fatter, and so the change is not coming from the so-called lower class. And then later, you say that the change should come from us, like as. Um, like supporting the local economies in order to have like a, a green economy shift. Mm. Like these two things uh, look like a little bit of a conflict to me. Like how do we, again, how do we support the local economy is if ourselves again are actually fatter and stupid and we cannot do that because to me, I'm kind of pessimistic on this side. I don't think that we can convince enough people to go green in the short time we have. On this, on that side, I think we are doomed. Like we have to open some kind of bigger shift. Like the German philosophy just quoted, like someone like Tesla. If we have to, if you make uh, something that's affordable and um, actually green enough, everybody will just buy it because it's the most affordable way, not just because it's the green way. <laughs> yeah, but but I think we, I think we, you know, I think this uh, about sustainability. Everything is changing rather fast, you know. Uh, there was this Danish politician two years ago who said that we uh, we have to eat less uh, beef, and uh, just two years ago people were laughing at him, you know, saying you shouldn't decide what I'm eating. But now everybody agrees on that. Of course, we have to eat less beef. Like it's obvious, and I think the whole discussion is is changing rather fast. And uh, but the interesting thing is that we don't have the system to support it. We don't have for instance, green production of energy yet. Uh, we still is transporting stuff huge distances, you know. And um, but but I think we have to everybody is realizing that we have to do something. And and the whole thing about sustainability is actually a way of people regaining power over society, I think. It's regaining political power. Because the end of if that means the end of globalization, it will also mean that power will come back to, to, you know, the, the forces that work on Europe. It will be more local than right now, where everything is is global, and uh, and therefore you know local politicians they don't really have they can't affect you know the big picture. They can only try and and adapt to the to the new uh, situation. 
So like yeah. making people, the people understand that going green is a way to yeah, but I think get like economical gonna, power. Maybe that's the no, no, no. <laughs> I think it's going to come from the people. I think it's going to come. Uh, change is going to come from consumers. I think, yeah. and from uh, big corporations as well. that will move their you know production back home. And I, I think we will start uh, buying stuff in a in a in a new way. You know, but maybe we can live without buying a t-shirt from H&M for 25 kroners or you know maybe we can we can live with that you know maybe that we have to uh, spend 100 kroners on a t-shirt and then uh, if there's a hole in it we can repair it or fix yeah, it yeah. And, uh, um, so I think it's gonna um, I think that's, that's gonna change everything within a very short while thank you I was really interested in your story about the man who wanted to sort of change into like a bird and as well as um, Copenhagen itself. It seems like um, human beings in your literary landscape are able to draw from nature while still maintaining power and control over nature. Um, so that being said, I was wondering what role nature had in your literary landscape and what the relationship it was with the people in it. Yeah, it's a good question. Uh, um, I don't know if I can answer that at all, but you know, um, but uh, one of the points with uh, with the guy who's transforming into a bird is that he actually doesn't know if it's working, you know, and we, and the reader doesn't know if it's working. There's also another guy in, this, in another story who tries to commit suicide by throwing himself out of the mountain, and he uh, ends up in this uh, compost. Um, and uh, he doesn't get killed, but his arms and legs <coughs> are getting turned the other way. But he survives. And then after a year or so, he, he survives by drinking these uh, juices from old vegetables. And then, But he, his arms is backwards and his legs are backwards. But then he learns to walk so, and crawl trees and stuff like that. So it also goes wrong from time to time. Uh, I, I'm not sure that's an answer in any uh, <laughs> in any respect. Um, but as I said before, I, I think it's very interesting to think of something cultural and, so, as, and something natural, not as something that is um, uh, opposite each other. We, we uh, you know, everything we did as human beings in history is the opposite of nature. Nature used to be evil, it used to be uh, storms and floods and diseases that we have to protect ourselves from. And all the cities we built has been cultural phenomena that was uh, the opposite of nature. But I think it's very interesting to think, think, to think of nature and culture as something that might be uh, sort of the same. Or, uh, I think that's also where technology is going right now, that you could actually make something that's both cultural and natural at the same time. And maybe maybe that's what we need to do, you know, in order to to keep living here on this planet, that the culture we create has to be something that is much more agreeable to nature. Thank you, I appreciate it. I'm wondering uh, how, if you think it does, your, your literary voice reflects a, uh, a Nordic or a Danish uh, sensibility and thinking about uh, you know, the traditions of Danish nature poetry and uh, that sort of thing. It's a distinctive perspective, I think. You mentioned uh, uh, you know, admiring writers like Calvino and Kafka, but you know, maybe uh, I wonder if you thought when you were conceiving this at all about Jeppe Popiert, uh, if any of those kinds of uh, traditions in Danish literature and satire and irony and attitudes toward nature and so on fit into your yeah. uh, literary point of view. Well, it's a, it is a comedy in some sense, and it, it, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's sort of a comedy, but it's also a utopia. It's also a dream, you know, of... It's a strange sort of political dream um, that you can somehow unite 
the cultural and the natural worlds into one. But um, and then I, I I wondered there's a lot of descriptions about the mountain that is quite poetical. So I thought that was fun also to uh, to you know describe how beautiful it was this mm-hmm. man-made creation you know mm-hmm. and uh, and at, at the same time it, it it's an event the mountain that is. Uh, lives it o- its own life you know it's beyond our control things happen on the mountain the the mountain evolved in a way that we couldn't have predicted when they built it so uh, that i like that too uh, yeah I, I just heard this is your first visit to Beijing. Yeah. yeah yeah so have you had a chance to go to some palace or Jinchang park no right because Mountains, right? Well, Jinchang Park has got an artificial mountain, mm. and um, it's quite nice. You don't have to make it 3.5 kilometers high. I mean, mm. it's just about what is it like? Maybe 80 meters high. Yeah. That's all you need to do. Mm. And <laughs> no, 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 no. And it, I don't agree. <laughs> it, it's real, have a have a walk, have yeah. a look around, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I'm sure we can find someone who can actually fill. Yeah. Uh, Denmark, all full of little mountains and hills. It's gonna be, it's gonna be lovely, and it's gonna be a lot cheaper. You sound like my, you sound like my counselor. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but we have, we have a, a 80 meter high mountain in Denmark, and it's wonderful. But it's a little bit too little, I think. You know, you, you get a sense of the wind in your hair when you're on top of the mountain. But, but you know, that that mountain was. Um, uh, that little that hill, 80 meters high, was done 400 years ago, hmm. and China has this capacity to kind of like do a little bit better than that these days. Hmm. Um, so yeah, just well, talk, why did they build it? Just talk what, to what some did, of these girls. <laughs> <laughs> why did they build it? Um, it was around the Forbidden City. There was a hmm. moat. Hmm. Uh, there's a moat. It's still there today. So hmm. what they did is they took the moat. The when they dug the moat up. Yeah, okay. They decide they had to do something with the um, with all the with all the uh, soil, and yeah. they decided to build a lovely mountain okay. uh, right uh, next to the <laughs> you know just to sort of walk around. Um, and uh, they did the same thing with the summer palace, and I believe there's quite a few instances. But of that is it a nice there. place? Huh? Do you think it's a nice place? Uh, yeah, I think it's lovely. Why, why not make it, make it bigger then? <laughs> <laughs> so it'd be extra nice and extra big, you know. So, uh, 400 years ago, it was probably very impressive. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just want to add that back then when um, the central government was planning the Xi'an new area, they actually thought about getting a mountain at the back of the, the new area, but the plan was uh, shut off because because it's not what the general concepts these days are. Because well, if you notice the um, news, uh, the the policy is to emphasize the natural terrain of uh, cities and uh, towns, and uh, uh, before that, a lot of cities will well, dig up a mountain to have more flat land for buildings, constructions, and now that's forbidden. And uh, just a, like a really interesting as perspective in this discussion, because uh, we are not doing it anymore. Yeah. <laughs> you, you mean building you obstacles? Yeah, actually the, the mountains he talked about it's uh, leftover soils yeah, from yeah. Uh, previous uh, constructions projects, mm, mm. and they just use it uh, to, uh, well, to make some landscapes. Mm. And uh, early on, in uh, I mean, several years before, when China's uh, experiencing like massive constructions all over the country. Uh, a lot of place will like flatten up, flatten the land, mm. just to create some uh, more area for development. Mm. Yeah, and we're not doing it anymore. <laughs> mm-hmm.
So it's questions for the author and also Jia Yi. So I obviously never read the uh, Copenhagen Mountain because it's in Danish, but uh, just about urban design in general and the future of cities. So there are two schools of thoughts. Basically, one is we're all moving towards this uh, ecumenopolis kind of scenario where the entire planet is covered by the city. And there's another school of thought where that we should we should be building self-contained, small, self-sufficient communities in the future. So from a speculative and also from an actual urban planning perspective, just wondering what your thoughts are regarding the matter. And also uh, another point is uh, there are some concerns that uh, in the future with the concentration of urban population, cities might turn to like a all-powerful surveillance hub and sort of like a panopticon scenario. So also what are your thoughts on that matter as well? Yeah. Um, you want to start? No, 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 you go first. <laughs> okay. Uh, actually, in my, it's, in my third book, it's, it's uh, very much about that topic. It's, uh, and in that book, many of the rich people are moving out of the city and into sort of closed community areas in the outside in the countryside and they curate the nature make it more beautiful and they live on sort of try to create a life that's uh, sustainable self-sustainable but it's also on a very high you know aesthetical level so they are very concerned about how the sounds they're hearing and the way things are smelling so you can only ride horses in the cities, for instance, because it's, it's, it, ma it makes a nicer sound and stuff like that. And at the same time, they have drones that can take care of their crops and things there in the, because they are self-supplying. And, um, and it's, it, you know, it costs 10 millions just to move out there and then you have to buy a house also. So it's only for rich people and it's, closed off and it's all the houses are built in national romantic style you know old-fashioned style and they try and recreate the sort of uh, old-fashioned small idyllic cities and uh, and that's where they live and, uh, I, and I think that could very well be a development that you would see because of yeah because it's uh, because you can work from there and you know if you if your network is really if your network is people who are also rich and capable you know that's uh, that's really all the network you need you know you don't need all the other people in the city actually and then you can go to the city from time to time and they do sometimes and but they mainly staying in there closed community that's that that uh, that's that's uh, that's a very uh, that is a very beautiful place so I think maybe that's perhaps that's one way of things would develop uh, so about one one oh, quick sorry, one quick sorry, answer sorry. just uh, give me a little a little bit of time uh, about you're asking about the scale of a city, and uh, actually it's a debate over like centuries. We have like different models for uh, cities, like garden cities by Howard or other arch architectures and urban planners. But uh, I think the uh, well, large cities has its uh, advantages and their downsides, but clusters also have their problems. So it's kind of like a balance when you want efficiency, like uh, usually large scale cities are more efficient in like um, networking, in, uh, in people uh, communicating, uh, the exchange of information flows stuff. And clusters would be more sustainable in a way. And I think what we are facing uh, today with all these uh, problems with cities is that we don't have the technology to make huge cities sustainable. That's the problem. Because uh, for large cities, you have like this huge supportive, supportive system 
infrastructure um, and powers and energy and uh, the most importantly the um, water water supply stuff and these are what we cannot solve at this point by technology for really large scale cities like Beijing. Uh, the traffics we can't deal with like uh, massive uh, tra public transportation. And that's why uh, sometimes we think like uh, smaller cities will have more advantage. But uh, in uh, effic efficiency uh, level, uh, large cities will provide, well, people actually, uh, especially in China, people prefer top tier cities, Beijing, Tianjin, Guangzhou, Shanghai, because it's more efficient. They have more opportunities. Uh, they generate uh, more economy, sometimes more than a lot of large provinces, because uh, pe people uh, people clusters in this place, and they got a lot of things done in a short di distance. That's the advantage of large cities. So it's a debate, and I think it will move like forward and backwards, time from time to time. But uh, like Casper uh, said earlier, the people are the one who choose what kind of city they want. They vote by their foot. They migrate to where they prefer. And uh, technology is the another force to solve the problems we've created. But also technology is the uh, usually what causes new problems. So it will be like, it's not a definite answer, but well, I think everybody's trying to get like, better solutions. But don't you think energy will, mm -hmm. will be pr produced uh, or it would be possible to mm -hmm. harvest energy in smaller, much smaller entities? You don't have to have a huge power plant in, in the future. You'll probably mm -hmm. be able to sustain your house with some you're solar panels and, and stuff uh, like you're that. You're referring to solar panels and the wind power, right? Yeah. But uh, right now, uh, I've talked to uh, people who work in the power supply industry the more uh, stable source of energy is still like uh, hydraulic and uh, the the firepower those those are the more re uh, stable sources um, but, but, but solar panels are becoming but twice solar, as effective yeah. every second year right yeah so but, and so mm, in a few years time mm, you know it, it will mm, be able to you will mm, be able to produce mm, the energy you need in, in small mm. you know entities you don't have to have huge power plants it's idealism but if you look at Beijing you have this small space a relatively small space with a massive population that the well energy per unit they produce in this area could not support the whole city, the, the whole population. And uh, also what we face is that solar power itself needs power, needs power to build it, need uh, like uh, materials and uh, processes and all these to build it. And that also costs energy and uh, natural resources. So it's like, yeah. yeah. Also, like if the, the only big drawback on solar and wind power is that there is a limit on how much a single yeah. solar panel or a windmill can generate, like only 30% of the energy that goes in. If, if you have a panel which is 100% uh, efficiency, it's, gonna, it's only going to absorb 30% of the solar power. That's a mathematical equation you cannot run away from. So this is why the like, um, uh, hydroelectric uh, power, the one you put under the mountain, that's actually a much better solution for geothermic power mm. from yeah. uh, the earth core, which is never going to turn off for even better fusion yeah. power. Yeah. Mass, mass drilling is going into that right now, and yeah. uh, they might want to drill uh, holes, you know, if you drill a hole eight kilometers deep, you can even have, you know, uh, gases that can drive the, the turbines in, uh, in power plants, but that's, uh, that's science fiction right now. Yeah. But another thing is that I find interesting is that, uh, do you know a, thing, uh, a concept called therapy gardens? Mm. It's something that developed, they have in Sweden, 
and uh, it's not a it's not just a, a good story, but it's something that they started doing in Sweden in the 70s, and they have it connected to lot University, so it's very well, uh, you know, it's uh, scientifically proven that um, uh, therapy gardens is, is the best way to uh, to cure stress. People who are really stressed, at, and you know, you can die from stress. So people who have stress in real terms. And um, and uh, a therapy garden has to. You, you come you come to uh, to a garden for four weeks, and you leave your mobile phone, and you eat some very simple food, and you have to take care of a little uh, uh, piece of uh, of land. And uh, but the garden has to have live up to certain specifications. There have to be uh, differences in the terrain. Mm -hmm. You know uh, the height, the height yeah. differences. There have yeah. to be running water. Mm -hmm. There has to be a high degree of um, diversity, plant diversity, and then there has to be uh, living animals. But if these factors are there, people get cured. And I think that's just uh, it's just a wonderful thing that we might are forgetting right now when we're living in in uh, in these big cities that uh, we are actually depending on nature it's actually something that can uh, make us uh, happy and uh, and maybe cure us also so uh, i think that's another reason why people perhaps are gonna move out in smaller self-sufficient um, uh, cities um, I was actually thinking about uh, High Line Parks in New York City. Uh, there, uh, there were the. Uh, I believe Jai has a lot to tell 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 us about it. Um, it was a, uh, abandoned Galtier tracks. <laughs> it, it's called High Line, so it's, um, so the the rails is up up on high, and it's supposed uh, supposedly. On uh, transporting for coals and just it it's a <laughs> it's a product of industrialization. So, um, but nowadays the uh, the train the uh, the rail tracks are abandoned and um, uh, they go. D um, I forgot where they where they were from the um, the mastermind behind Highline Parks. Uh. Um, Anyways, two guys came up with this idea and build the um, re mm, and construct. Just planted some uh, green um, leafy greens up on the tracks, and um, it became one of the major uh, uh, attractions for New York now. Mm -hmm. And it actually has some mm, uh, practical purpose. <laughs> so I was. Uh, that brings me to uh, Xinyu's question. Um, uh, what do you think about the um, artificial scenery, ar artificial natural green, or is it? Are we defying nature by by doing this, or are we we are we changing it and it, tuning it into our into a human uh, humanistic way? What do you think of? Take High Line as an example, or any of the central uh, central parks, Hyde parks. Is there any difference necessarily? Is there any difference between those artificial parks and the real uh, grassland and high mountains created by our mother nature? Um, is there any? Sorry, <laughs> there are a bunch of questions, um, and uh, are they? Interreplaceable between artificial and natural um, terrains and sceneries. Uh, yeah, uh, you, in many instances, there is. You know, for instance, uh, all the forests in Denmark are planted. So uh, we don't. We only have two natural for forests in Denmark. Right. Um, uh, but I read uh, a story that uh, there was this isolated island in Denmark who has been isolating, isolated for years. But then they were building a bridge and uh, one of the pillars was placed on this isolated island. And then after some years, you know, 
there was this strange phenomenon that uh, there was a lot of uh, of plants that started to grow there that you haven't seen before in Danish nature. Mm. And now, 20 years later, they actually uh, preserved the place because of its uh, beautiful nature. And it turns out that the reason why this nature occurred was because heavy traffic was throwing pollen, you know, uh, plants mm -hmm. off the side from trucks. And people were throwing, uh, you know, stones and uh, half-eaten the fruits out of the windows and fertilize it so yeah. everything started to grow in a new way mm -hmm. and now it's a preserved place and you can go there and visit the nature and there's a guide that shows you around and uh, that's something that's created you know out of the blue without any plan and and it seems to me you have to give nature so little you know then it's just evolving and effortlessly doing, yeah so uh, so why not I think it's a, uh, it, it, I think it's an amazing, it's an amazingly interesting idea to think about how you can create nature or mm -hmm. natural mm -hmm. experiences. I think it's very, it's something I like to think about. Yeah. And uh, because we've been doing so many stupid things, we've been straightening out rivers and yeah. all this, uh, and, and you know, Danish nature is more or less. Uh, you know, not nature anymore. Yeah. But, uh, I think we have to find our way back to creating something that is natural, but might also have a some some sort of plan. You know, yeah. might as well figure this out in an interesting way. Yeah. So I think that's uh, that's a real interesting path to an, an interesting thing to think about yeah. for me. Because what you're talking about, like I, I was sort of well, I was half joking before um, that the um, the sort of thing that you're talking about there, um, when they were working on the Olympics, there's a huge part just yeah. to the north of. Mm -hmm. Sorry. In the north of. Um, because you're talking about the, trying to get the balance between nature and um, and and planning, the um, the. There's a park which is just to the north of the Olympic site, um, which is quite huge. And it's actually that sort of situation where they tried really hard to do that. And I'm actually, even though I was sort of like joking, joking a little bit before, I'm actually a great fan of Chinese landscapes and what they're able to do in city environments. I mean, I think it's one of the um, underrated parts of what China can achieve and is still achieving. And probably the best example of that, and it never actually occurred to me because it, it doesn't even strike me as artificial, is that site just to the north of the Olympics, mm -hmm. um, the Olympic Forest Park it's called, because it does have, I didn't even think about it, but actually that are, they are the largest artificial mountains in Beijing and, and a little bit higher and you walk around it, you would just not know. Mm. And it is totally planned and each part of it is there is, a, there is a design behind it, which is all about trying to actually make you, um, it's trying to maximize your enjoyment of the space, which is quite big, and manage a very large number of people going through it in a way that makes you feel like you actually could be somewhere very, very far away. And the achievement there is, I, I think, is totally underrated. Um, so, if, and I've only been able to explore half of it so far. So um, if you do get a chance, probably even though even though Jinchang Park is the best example probably of something traditional, mm. and it's, it is awesome even in a modern sense, mm. if you really want to see that sort of thing, you can't, I don't think you could do better in the world mm. than to go to Olympic Forest Park just north of, mm. of the Olympic site. Mm. And maybe people will disagree with me, but I don't know, I think they'll probably agree with me. Just don't walk around the lake. There's uh, <laughs> someone down there in the back. David. Uh, no, I just wanted to comment on this uh, whole idea if you say that cities has been built to keep the nature out because the thing is that actually in Denmark this idea about sustainable cities is a big thing right now. I think we are even trying to sell the idea of sustainable cities to the rest of the world. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not. Yeah, but, yeah, but the thing is that I'm they. I'm not paid by any corporation <laughs> to make that clear, you know. 
It's like they want the cities to become more organic, right? They're trying to reintroduce nature into the cityscape. So before everything was concrete, everything was gray, but now we look at, okay, so maybe we have a problem of flooding. How can we use the nature to um, solve these problems? How can we uh, plant uh, grass areas? How can we plant forests or so on in the cities? But the thing that becomes a problem is that it becomes sort of a very um, artificial way of reintroducing nature into the city landscape. So it's not saying that it's a bad thing. People want to build gardens on the top of the buildings. They want to have more green in their life. I don't know if it's more, I should say, more of a, it's nice rather than it's actually you know, helping the city to become more sustainable. Is it really just a luxury thing? But, but what I wanted to comment is that actually in um, Denmark, we also have in Aarhus, there was an old railway where mm -hmm. it had been abandoned for a couple of years. And I talked with uh, a biolog, uh, someone who was working with sustainability who told me that they had started growing uh, a lot of new plants in this area and it has actually become quite a natural place because they have not tried to do anything with it for a long time. And then the city started talking about sustainability and how we should try to reshape the city. <laughs> and then they wanted to take down this area. They wanted to build something there. And he said, so in the quest to make the city more sustainable, we actually ruined the only natural part of the city. <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I, I, think the, I think the interesting thing is, is what happening, about what's happening right now is that I think sustainability is is gonna be an imperative is something you have to do that's what I think you know if companies cannot or will not be sustainable they will die so uh, so that's interesting so so it removes all hypocrisy doesn't it so uh, everything pans out perfectly in that sense of course, there's, there are assholes trying to sell something, you know, and lying about stuff. But uh, but I think this agenda is very real. It's, it's something we have to do in order to save the places where we live. We have to do it. And if it's uh, hypocrisy, you know, building a garden on top of a huge building, so be it. But uh, but. That doesn't mean that other changes won't happen because we have to change the way we produce and the way we spend resources. It's something we have to do, and I think actually I think it's it's really going to be a, a real shift in paradigm in the way the like it's going to be a historical shift in the way industri industrialization is has been working and uh, and. Um, And I think it's going to happen within, you know, a few years, like within five years, we'll see massive changes. And already now, investment funds are investing in companies that are sustainable because they see it as a mega trend, not necessarily because they are concerned about, you know, the, the climate. But uh, so, uh, so we also see a shift in money right now, going from uh, the black economy to something more sustainable mm. and and for instance like you know remember Kodak and there was the fourth biggest company in the world that died because of digi digitalization digital, what, digitalization of everything and the internet and uh, I think it's going to be the same with all these companies that are dependent on oil they're going to die if they can't change. Hi, um, sorry I haven't read your um, novel yet. It's but all right, nobody has. <laughs> It's okay. in Danish, no worries. <laughs> okay, but um, it strikes me that um, Mountain Copenhagen is like a besieged city, that people who live there are besieged or um, maybe even separated or isolated by the height of uh, where uh, of they lived. Um, actually, I wonder that if you really hold such a passive, um, passive 
uh, understanding of the structure of a city. I mean, uh, how do you how do you think of a structure of a city effect on the people who lives in there? I'd like to. I'd like to know about that. I, I, I'm not sure I understand completely the question. Um, um, because you you see in Beijing, the the city is um, comfort is con consist of five rings road, uh, not not only five rings but but ring <coughs> roads are separated uh, people from um, the center to the the the. Er the, the suburb, um, but in your book, the Copenhagen, uh, the, the, Co the mountain Copenhagen, the people lives in different height, I mean, yeah. and they are separated mm. with so each how other. Does that, does that affect social life or uh, so their social status or the way they meet each other? Or uh -huh. I haven't thought much about that. Okay, it, it, because... It's not, it's not a book about, you know, urban planning, really, it's just, uh, it's, it's a... It's, uh, you know, it's fiction, you know, it's okay. a fictionary just oh. piece of work, you know, it's just an idea that I thought was funny, you know. All right, because and, uh, uh, fr from the character you just mentioned, there's a bird man and also yeah. a man who want to get suicide. Mm. Um, it, it tells, uh, it, it feels that uh, the only way they want to get out of the city is to die or, or, yeah, or cut, cut themselves to make sacrifices. So I feel maybe you hold a passive passive understanding of the structure of the of a city. I mean so Yeah, but maybe about maybe maybe mentioning something I haven't thought about myself. I don't know. Okay. I don't know. <laughs> that okay. Might be so true. so I, I wonder if you have a, if you have an ideal structure of city maybe. But <laughs> perhaps with seas Or just you, you're content with where you live now, like. I'm content with where I live. Yeah, but I don't know. I've, I've lived in the same place all my life almost. I've moved maybe two kilometers. <coughs> uh, so uh, okay. I don't like moving. You know, I don't like traveling. Wow, that's very imagine. Yeah. Imaginative. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I just like to stay in the same place all the time. You know. I okay. think and I like, uh, I like when no, nothing changes. Sorry. <laughs> I think he actually holds a, a very optimistic view about this because in the, um, as he mentioned in, in his third book, um, the rich and famous, just the, the ruling class is also, um, is actually uh, living in the suburbs rather than in the city, clustered with the rest of us. <laughs> um, right. So yeah, it's pretty, uh, for us, it's, there's a paradigm of, of sci-fi stories and we're always gonna live up, well, the rich and famous, they're gonna be living up um, in a high rise, uh, which has a view. <laughs> but it, uh, I think it's also, uh, the, the only thing that's, uh, um, that I think it's gonna make the rich not move in together, all of them, in, mm -hmm. in uh, in like exclusive small societies is that they want to be viewed by us as the rich and famous you know so <laughs> we have to be able to see them you know i think that's very important so the distance can't be too far away you know or they or they need to be exposed in some other ways you know right. i think that's important that might explain the mountain because then you can see their houses you know even from a distance, you know, <laughs> you can see them skiing up there. I, several things come to my mind, and I wish I had read your book, and I could have read it in Danish if, if I had seen it. But, but I refused. <laughs> 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 but I didn't ever see it, no, it only today I heard about you, actually. But I'm thinking, my experience is more in New York, and um, one thing, and say the United States, which is a big place, but cities to me represent um, cooperation and integration. And um, if I look at the country I came from, the most thoughtful liberal people as groups live in the cities, live on the coasts, and this inland where there's 
nature or farms or something, it's where there is more isolation and more intolerance. So cities, I think, have an advantage of, of bringing people together, and you say culturally, bringing ideas together. Um, also, nature is a kind of an abstract thing, too, because because we control nature in some way. I mean, we have national parks. We, uh, um, I was just in Gansu province up in, in a Rainbow Mountain, uh, which is a natural area that was, I think, privately owned and not the government owns it. But now there are roads or walkways to go through it so people can come and be in it, but not disturb what's there. And it's very peaceful, very nice, even though you're with a lot of people. So it's a, I think globally now, we, it's, you have to work hard to get a long way into what we call real nature. So we do with the Chinese gardens who bring nature to us, make the illusion of the larger nature. And sometimes we do that in the small window garden we have or uh, the corner garden that's a community garden. But um, the other thing about cities, about New York, is it, it's now the rich people are going to New York, not out of New York, and it's just outpricing everybody. It's going to be a kind of an exclusive place again. So, and my other question, or thought rather, as far as sustainability and what we do, Europe, especially Northern Europe, is a whole different story than the rest of the world because the population is low and things can happen. I mean, we really have to look at Asia, um, of China and India and uh, the Middle East and Africa, where there are huge populations, lots of things are happening, and the West has had a huge influence historically on all of these areas. Um, but they raise different questions. Thank you. I just think that, again, you know, I think that uh, sustainability is going to be the, like, it's going to be as important as price, you know. In uh, within a few years, and uh, and the question is, if it's the way we are living now, mainly in big cities, if that's sustainable, I think that's the main question. To I think that's maybe really what you're asking, you know, because if it's not sustainable to live in mega cities, uh, we we can't do it anymore. It might be extremely difficult not to, but we have to. How do you envision that happening uh, in a country like China, where hundreds of thousands, hundreds of millions of people have been moved into cities, and that effort is not even stopping, uh, and sees no real end in sight as far as government moving people into cities? At what point do you see that stopping and reversing? Um, and on the back of that, um, you say in, on a five-year timetable, which I see as likely in in a in a country like Denmark <coughs> with the uh, demographics and the political structure, but as far as c countries like India, China, um, Indonesia, um, and then companies like China Energy, Saudi Aramco, um, how do you see a five-year timetable for sustainability flipping all of that on its head? Well, I think, I think you're mentioning the reasons why nothing has, has happened yet, you know. For, because it's too complex, it's too difficult to do something about it. But I, I just think in the, in the next coming in the coming years, we are getting so close to a situation that's going to be irreversible that we absolutely have to make these changes. This, this is the maybe the last twenty years we have to do anything in. So we have to do it, even though it, that it's you know completely impossible. It's just an imperative. It, it's it's changes that has to be done, otherwise you know uh, we're going to face an, an, a totally different reality that's much more pro problematic. So I think we are we are we are coming closer to the edge now that everybody is realizing that that this is this is it you know within the next ten years we have to make these changes. So we, we have to. That, that, that's the whole interesting idea. That's that's why it's, I think it's a shift in paradigm because it's it's not a um, it's not a politically driven you know change. It's it's something that's that's exterior that's coming from the outside and and defining you know 
a dramatic change in the way we live, the way we work, the way we produce stuff, the way we, uh, you, the way we uh, spend our money, you know, and it, it changes everything. That's what I think is going to happen within the next 10 years. Is that it? Though the story is excessively in uh, inevitable, there's steep urgency in the details of these tales. I think it's a story that expects to be uh, relevant sooner rather than, rather than later, and it reminds us we can rarely see bubbles when we're in them, whether housing or environment. The magnitude of Mount Copenhagen reads like a dystopia, but until you realize how close we are, already are, to being too late. And yet, what defines Mount Copenhagen um, beneath this, I, I felt like it's, um, it's anti, it's an, it kind of depicts our anger to toxic capitalism and it's despair over inadequate environmental measures is this threat of hope that somehow we might yet move the mountain enough to make it through. Um, let's give it up for Casper, Xin, Xin Yu, and Jia Yu for the thought-provoking discussion. And you can, you know, you can always come here and uh, talk to us more. And have a great night. Thanks so much. I I, I wanted to uh, say one more thing. Uh, I did want to. I was remiss in uh, forgetting to thank uh, Sugan and Borglin of the Copenhagen Main Library. Uh, we're, we were lucky this week because uh, it's Beijing Design Week and, and it's Copenhagen uh, and Denmark in uh, cooperation with Beijing Design Week, which has given us this opportunity to uh, have Casper here. So thank you very much, Susan, uh, and the Copenhagen Main Library. And I'm sure there's probably some other uh, government support that um, should be should be noted. And so, um, thanks so much, uh, all of you. And I have to say thank you to this guy. <laughs> see, see, I I, <coughs> I knew I knew there was somebody out there that needed to be thanked. <laughs> all right. So thanks so much, and uh, stick around and uh, continue your conversations. Uh, have a drink and. Uh, uh, or join the young people outside who are uh, who are very raucously uh, meeting one another and uh, and uh, and and having a great time too. All right, have a good night. Uh, thanks for coming. Um, I also wanted to add that Xiu uh, Xinyu here. Um, she's. Um, She's um, publishing a short um, collection of her stories, all 15 of them, uh, in a collection of stories, perhaps, uh, of course. Um, she's a very talented, young sci-fi author, really up and coming. Um, I've read some of her stuff. She's majored in uh, Western philosophy back in college. Um, she writes, uh, she's a screenwriter. Um, and uh, stop me if you want. Um, yeah, because I, I know that most most sci-fi authors they're uh, multitasking people. They all have their day jobs, um, multiple day jobs. Um, so um, if you want to shoot send you any questions regarding her stories, um, I'm happy to translate for you. Oh, also, some of the questions that I shoot, uh, that I shot the, the authors were coming from Xin Yu. It's just easier for me to just spit it out. But yeah, give it up for Xin Yu.
Thank <laughs> you.